How's it going everyone? In today's video, we're going to learn about five tips and tricks to make your life a bit easier in Python. Starting with one of the most popular tricks, the underscore formatting trick. Suppose you have a big number such as a billion and scientific notation scares you, so you decide to type that number out by hand. For example, here we might have one billion, which will equal one billion. And I'm being very careful when I type this out because it's quite easy to mix up the zeros. Now, this is perfectly acceptable, but considering it requires you to manually count the zeros, it can be quite easy to mess this up. So instead, a better approach would be to use underscores. Underscores allow you to easily format your number, which makes it much easier to read without affecting your code in any way. That means that if you were to use this number in any operation, such as when you are printing something, it will ignore the underscores. Also, if you're doing math, it's going to ignore those underscores. And this also works with decimal numbers, such as pi, which could equal 3.14 underscore 15 underscore 92 underscore 65. There's not really any reason to format it like this, but just to show you that you can do it, I decided to do it with pi. And it doesn't have to be every three zeros either. You can choose your own rules when it comes to how you'd like to place the underscore, with a few exceptions being that they cannot be placed directly next to each other. Also, your number cannot end with an underscore or begin with an underscore. Otherwise, you can get as crazy as you like with them. Something else that's quite cool is that you can also use it with f strings. So if you were to type in my number of type int equals one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero, if you were to print this inside an F string and provide an underscore, it would give you the output with underscores. The alternative to this is the comma, but I'm not really covering that. I'm just covering the underscore right now. The second trick that I use on a daily basis is a formatting trick used for quick debugging. Let's take a look at how it works. For this example, I'm going to create a variable of type integer, which will equal 10 and a name of type string, which will equal Bob. Usually, if you would like to debug this, you would either print the name directly, or you could also type in name equals name. And when you run this, what you should get as an output is the variable value. Personally, I would never do this because something that's much more simple is typing in your variable inside some curly braces and passing in an equals. And with this, I'm also going to paste in the variable and when we run it, what you should notice as an output is the variable name plus the variable's value. And this actually works with any expression. For example, if I were to duplicate the name and pass in the length of the name, when we run this, what we're going to get as an output is the length of name equals three. Otherwise, we can also type in, let's say 10 plus 10 equals, and we're going to get the result back. To make this easier to understand, you might choose to put parentheses there so it's much more readable. Or another approach would be to add some spaces around the equals. And when you run it, you should get something a bit more legible. What's important to note here is that all of the spaces here are maintained. So you can add a lot of spaces in random places. And when you run it, it's going to maintain those spaces. It's up to you how you want to customize this. Moving on, I have another quick tip that will give you more control over your F strings. I'm going to show you how you can nest curly brackets so that you can control format specifiers with variables instead of having to hard code them each time. First of all, let's create a user called Bob. Next, we're going to print the F string of the user and I'm going to use the colon underscore caret 11. And what this does is insert this symbol around Bob and it's going to occupy 11 characters of space and center Bob. So when we run this, we're going to end up with something like this. As you can see, the symbol is the underscore, Bob is centered as we defined with the caret, and this occupies a total of 11 characters. We could also change it with a different symbol, such as the at sign, but I much prefer the underscore. Anyway, we can also do this with the right angle bracket and the left angle bracket, and we will get this as an output. Now this is quite cool, but what if you want to change the total amount of characters 
later on in the program. Obviously, the last thing we want to do is change each one of these individually. So what we're going to do instead is create a variable called width, which will be of type integer, and specify the value of 20. Now inside here, instead of specifying 11, we can pass in the width in curly brackets, and we can just copy and paste that for the rest. Now, when we run this, we should get the desired width as an output for all of them, and we only need to change it in one place. And this can also be quite useful for other format specifiers, such as imagine you have a float called pi, which will equal 3.14159265, because that's all I can remember. And we want to round this to two decimal places. Well, here we can create a variable called places of type integer and specify that to be two. So that when we print the f string of pi, and we say we want to round this to two decimal places, we won't have to hard code this value. We can just change this to places. Now, when we run this, it should get rounded to two decimal places. And we can also change this to four, if that's what we want. The fourth tip of the day has to do with accessing values from a dictionary. And this is something that all Python devs should be familiar with because it really simplifies our lives. So for this example, we're going to create a dictionary of users and it's going to be of type integer to string, which means the keys are integers and the values are strings. Now, if we ever want to access a user, we could just print that user at the specified key. So we can print users at the index of zero if we want to get Bob. And that's going to give us back Bob. And this approach works, but it's quite risky because if you were to provide a key that doesn't exist, you would end up with a key error. Now you might be saying, indently, you silly cocoon, why don't you type in if zero in users print user found and pass in that user, which will be at the index of zero. This check will help us avoid the error if zero doesn't exist. Now, if we were to run this, our program will be able to print Bob if Bob exists in the user database. If we were to pass in four, this if expression would return false and would avoid calling this code, which would surely raise an exception. And once again, there's nothing wrong with that, but there's another way which can be seen as much more convenient. And what we're going to use here is something called get. And this method changed my world when I was first learning Python, because here you can specify a key and if it exists, it's going to return that element or that value. If the key doesn't exist, it's going to return none. So if you prefer to work with the none type, use the get method. Otherwise, we also have the option to use a method called set default, which is another one of my favorite methods, because here you can specify the key that you're trying to use and a default value. Here we can type in unknown, which will be returned each time we pass in a key which does not exist in our dictionary. Right now, if we were to run this, we would get unknown back. Otherwise, if we were to pass in two, we would get Sandra back. And if you don't specify anything and pass in four, you will get none back by default. It's actually quite interesting that Pyrite is complaining because apparently the default value is not required, but the static type checker thinks it is required. Interesting. Anyway, it's better to specify a default value here because otherwise you should just use the get method. And finally, the last trick slash tip of the day is something that I absolutely recommend you get into the habit of doing to really make sure you avoid unexpected bugs and surprises when developing a program. When jotting down ideas, you might start off by creating a bunch of placeholders such as these ones. And this is a perfectly acceptable approach when you are planning a project. Obviously, it's quite hard to code every single function at once. So in general, you would like to create a skeleton that kind of gives you an idea of how the program should function. And since you can't really leave a function empty, your first instinct is going to be to use the built-in pass keyword. But there's an approach I recommend much more because it's much safer and won't give you any ugly surprises. So instead of passing, I recommend you pass in raise not implemented error. And for now, we're just going to copy and paste it and pass it into everything else. And you might be asking, why do I recommend using this over pass? Well, right now, if we were to call any of this code, such as connect, what we're going to get as an output is a not implemented error. And this tells us that the function is not finished. It's not implemented. It's something that we need to work on. 
Otherwise, it's going to crash our program immediately or raise an exception. If we were to just use pass here, the program would not crash. It would not raise an exception. And in a small script, that might not really be an issue because you know exactly where you use pass. But as your projects grow in complexity, if you have this in a different file, you might just be waiting randomly for connect to do something. But since nothing was implemented, you'll have no idea that you forgot to add the functionality to that function. And that's why I recommend you raise a not implemented error whenever you can, because it's extra explicit. It tells whoever's working on this program that that function still needs to be worked on. And even better, if you're working on a different file and you try to call this function, it's going to tell whoever's working on this immediately that something's wrong, that the function is not finished. Also, this is the bare minimum, but you might also want to provide a message if you want to give whoever's working on this some extra context, such as, I don't know, I will do this later, Bob, since Bob is kind of lazy. Now, the next time you run it, you'll see that little message. If you have nothing important to say, you can exclude it, but if you have a reason on why it's not implemented, feel free to add it. Personally, I have a shortcut that fills this out for me when I create a function. All I have to do is type in def, and when I tap on enter, here I get to type in the name of my new function, such as connect. And at the end, it fills out everything for me. Although this message might be seen as quite redundant. Personally, I like it, so I'm leaving it, but you're not required to do this. I'm just showing you what I do. And let's call this so you can see it connect. As you can see, here we tried to call connect and we encountered a not implemented error that connect was not implemented. Personally, I like this more because I can read the message once again down here rather than relying on the error message up here. Anyway, that's actually all I wanted to cover in today's video. Do let me know in the comment section down below which one of these tips you enjoyed the most or whether you have any tips of your own. I would love to hear about it in the comment section down below. But otherwise, with all that being said, as always, Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.